You're listening to Slick Talk, the hospitality podcast, a podcast for those who are in and around the hospitality industry who love, live, and breathe what they do. You can join us for candid and unscripted conversations with hospitality experts and founders as we go deeper into their personal stories while they're sharing their triumphs and trials that got them to where they are today. I'm your host, Will Slickers, and you're listening to an episode of Slick Talk, the hospitality podcast. Now, let's begin. All right, Slick Talkers, we are back. And as you know, our guests are amazing. And this has been one in the making for a quite a bit, I would say. Ashley, I met you in 2021 officially in person at the Book Direct show in Miami. And I remember us talking about doing a podcast and I told you, I was like, look, I have a rule. We do a year when you're in business and we wait. And then after a year, I get people on the show because I think there's a lot of learnings. And so I want to want A, welcome you to the show and B, Let's talk about In Haven and the changes that you've gone over since we met in 2021. I think there's a quite an extensive history already. Yeah, thanks, Will, for having me. I'm glad to be here, and it's always fun running into you in the conference circuit. So I come from, I started In Haven because of my experiences as, as an avid vacation rental guest. Mm. Um, I have four little kids, and so when we travel, we stay in vacation rentals. We no longer stay in hotels. And we prefer that that type of say. We want multiple bedrooms, a big kitchen, et cetera. Um, but, you know, we were oftentimes finding places, booking on channels like Airbnb and Verbo. And, you know, the pictures look great, location look great, but we would show up to like terrible mattresses, missing pots mm. and pans, super frustrating. And I'm a lifelong merchant. I've spent most of my career sourcing products, um, most recently for the Home Depot and their home furnishing side. And um, so I'm naturally curious, you know, how do these property owners and managers source products? I spoke to dozens and dozens of them trying to understand how they find products for these properties. And overwhelmingly, the response was, it's a nightmare. And I have no idea what I'm purchasing. Um, You know, it's not the same types of products that I buy for my own home. I need things. I kept hearing the word durable. needs to be durable. It needs to withstand the wear and tear because gas can be super hard on and, you know, having been at, most recently at the Home Depot, I know that all of our suppliers, our manufacturers that were manufacturing our products have two main product lines. They have one for retail, which is, you know, the products they put out in Macy's and Walmart, Amazon. And then they have another product line for the hotels and restaurants, mm. which are all commercially tested. And, um, and so they're much more durable. And so, you know, the challenge I thought was, well, this could be a really cool opportunity. Let's bring the product lines that are available to hotels and restaurants to this new consumer group, it offers up a whole new revenue stream for these manufacturers. And so that's how the idea of Inhaven was born to bring, you know, more durable, consistent products to the vacation rental industry. So were you always in the merchant side of things in your career? Cause obviously like Home Depot, that's a big brand to be working with and to do all that yeah. stuff with what kind of, let's go a little pre in Haven, pre Home yeah. Depot. How did, how did that kind of build into? Cause I think there's, there's gotta be a story. Was that something you like dreamt of getting into when you're in high school or yeah. college or what? Yeah. Let's talk about that. Yeah. So I started my career in consulting at mm. Deloitte Consulting. Oh, you're a Deloitte gal. All right. No wonder why I like you. All right. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Yep. So we started there and Got into their consumer area where I was working with, you know, different types of consumer retail groups from Haynes Brands to Wrigley to a waste management company. Mm -hmm. I spent 14 months in Scottsdale on a project there. But I really enjoyed working on the consumer side of things. And I loved the projects, but, you know, we would sort of implement changes and then leave before you'd see anything come to fruition. Mm -hmm. And so I was very interested in, in going to work in consumer retail and was able found a job at Tiffany and Company on like a place like Indeed.com. Yeah. And ended up there in New York and um worked in their merchandising group. Started out in category management. So I don't know if you're familiar with the Tiffany Keys line, but that was a line oh, yeah. that I worked on and launched. And then eventually, you know, as I continued to always want to get closer and closer to the consumer, I joined the regional team. So I went out to Asia, lived in Hong Kong for five years, running Asia merchandising for them. So I was responsible for all of the assortments in the stores, inventory, but also the brand standards. So at Tiffany, one of my major roles was making sure that the guest that entered any store from Beijing to Sydney, Australia, 
had a very consistent experience. So they'd mm. walk in, they'd be hit with the same marketing messages. You know, they'd have a very consistent experience. And so I left Asia, came back to the Americas, ran the Americas, and then eventually took over um, global merchandising operations. And that was another one of my biggest responsibilities was making sure on it from a global perspective that there was a very consistent guest experience in each of the stores. One of my old colleagues um, from Tiffany became the CEO of the company store, which is a Home Depot private label brand. And she asked if I would join and, be, and run merchandising there. And so that's how I eventually ended up at the Home Depot running merchandising for the company store. And that's where I got really ingrained in home furnishing, home textiles, traveled all over the world with them you know, going to manufacturers from India to China, all over the U.S. And so that's really gained a lot of knowledge um, from the home furnishing side. And also I ran that e-commerce business. So really, um, you know, got a great lesson in e-commerce. All right, Slick Talkers, so sorry to interrupt, but obviously you know what to expect when you listen to an episode. And that's for us to give an amazing shout out to our amazing partners. And one of those amazing partners is Minute. We've been with Minute for a while and we use them in all of our vacation homes and recreation vacation rentals. So every home gets a noise sensor. And the reason why we do this is because one, it's 100% privacy safe. And with the whole Airbnb banning indoor cameras, which again, if any of you use them, shame on you, don't have indoor cameras, get Minute, replace that, have it be privacy safe, where it only measures decibel levels. And that's super important because you're not recording conversations and eavesdropping on your guests. You're just measuring noise. And that's gonna be so helpful for you and your team because then you're gonna be able to decide when parties are happening based on decimal levels and alerts from minute. On top of occupancy, you know, you could tell how many cell phones are connected to the Wi-Fi. All these other things are happening inside the home that really prove a case for parties and maybe even when your home's unoccupied, when things go wrong, someone breaks in, something happens, right? You'll be able to have the proof and the knowledge of understanding what's happening inside of your property without actually being creepy and weird by spying on your guests and your team. So get with Minutes, grab the link in the show notes, make sure you grab the special offer. And if you have more than 10 homes, guess what? Reach out to them. They're going to take great care of you. Let them know that Will from Slick Talk sent you and they're going to have you all set up. So thank you, Minute, for sponsoring this episode and for this show. We love your partnership. And of course, like always, we're back to the episode. Well, you, you said a phrase that I think you said a couple of times, and you said you constantly want to get closer to the consumer. And it's an interesting statement for me because I think consumer, right, like the B2C world is very different from B2B. And I was having a conversation last night here with a person in the industry. She was with Vicasa at one point and and she was talking about like, I would way rather be in B2B than B2C. And I was like, oh, interesting. Okay. Like obviously like our consumer in the vacation rental world or the hotel hospitality world is your, your guests, right? Like that is your consumer. They are consuming your product in a certain way, whether it's lodging or food or whatever. So tell me why you like getting closer to the consumer than rather maybe a B2B world. Maybe, maybe that could be a different statement too. So yeah. So it's really Who's consuming the information? Who's making the decisions? So really, you know, from B to C, that's the guest. From a B to B, that's the property manager or the owner. And really just, you know, putting myself in their shoes, understanding their experience and how we can drive value and bring, you know, more efficiencies to them. So, you know, I don't necessarily see it as two different, you know, it's, it's very similar to me if you're looking at it from a guest perspective or you're looking at it from a property management owner perspective. It's really putting myself in those shoes of the people that are making the decisions um, and making the best possible outcomes for them. Gotcha. Yeah, that mm -hmm. makes sense. I try to just say P to P, person to person, right? Like <laughs> yeah, Exactly. Like yeah. Whether you're the consumer or the business, right? We, we want to do business with people and people come in different sides, right? Consumer side as the guest or the con you know, mm -hmm. business side as the property manager or the owner. So what's been very interesting to me from moving from a B2C world to a B2B world is the the decisions are very different, the way that they make decisions. So in the yes. B2C world, you know, our customers at Tiffany and Home Depot sort of wanted a, a lot of different options and they wanted to read through reviews and filter down and get to the exact product that they're looking for. Mm -hmm. And it was a very emotional purchase, especially in jewelry and especially, you know, for sheets as an example, can be an emotional purchase for your purchase for your own, you know, your own home. Whereas the B2B is less emotional, right? It's just, I want to make the smartest and fastest decision for my property. Mm -hmm. And so that is a completely different way of thinking. And so it's, it's forced me to think very differently about how we serve up products to this, 
who are now new consumer, this B2B consumer, mm -hmm. how do we help them make quick decisions? So that's been a really fascinating learning for me. Well, yeah. And speaking of learnings for you, uh, have you had a entrepreneurial experience prior to InHaven? So I would say that, yes, even though I worked for these larger companies, when I was at Tiffany and Company going to Hong Kong, we were a team of 15 people that managed the entire Asia wow. region. It was over a billion dollars. Wow. And so, you know, we worked, it was a very small team managing this entire region. And then going to the company store, you know, we were a team of 50 people when I joined. And again, it was a very, you know, I wore multiple hats. I was, you know, merchandising, supply chain, communications, marketing, all those different hats. And so it was a very entrepreneurial environment at the company yeah. store, backed by this, you know, giant of Home Depot supporting us financially. So, yeah. So, I, so those would be my two entrepreneurial experiences. What would you say outside of the financial backing of Home Depot from that experience? How would you say this compares? Like what was expected maybe when you took this leap of faith into starting your own thing versus maybe what something you didn't expect? It's always my favorite question to ask because I think when I got into it too, I was like, oh, this is going to be great. I, we, we got product market fit already, da, 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 da. But then you're like a year in and you're like, oh, shit, just kidding. <laughs> Things are changing. It's growing. It's not what I imagined. So I'm curious if you had the same experience. Yeah, I think one of the main learnings I've had, and even though I wore multiple hats in both the role in Asia and then at the company store, is just how many more hats you're wearing mm. as an entrepreneur. What I want to be doing every day isn't necessarily what I am doing every day, you know, so um, yeah. having to, you know, manage finances and taxes to onboarding new employees from an IT perspective, you know, little things that necessarily happen on the site that I'm having to like, you know, troubleshoot and fix right away. Um, mm -hmm. So every day is very different, which I always have enjoyed, but some of the hats that I have to wear as a founder is, are not necessarily like my favorite things to be doing. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I totally get it. I totally yeah. get it. How's your experience been building a team? I've gotten to meet a lot of your teammates uh, along the way from all the conferences and trade shows that we've gone to. And I just, I love seeing the founder, especially like someone like you, right? Like, this is your first true entrepreneurial experience outside of like a backed Home Depot kind of department situation. And so seeing that, that you can find people to put in the right seats to hopefully fire yourself from some of those hats and actually get yourself into the place that you want to be. I always get really excited with that as I get excited when I can hire someone in my business to do the same thing. So I'm curious, how is your experience and what's your outlook on building a team? So I have to say, first and foremost, that I have been so fortunate with the team that I have today. We could not be where we are without them. And so I've been fortunate to meet people along the way in my life and that have joined this crazy venture with me mm -hmm. and, you know, just in Haven advocates. So, you know, most of the people that actually, almost all of them, I've had a prior experience with working. For example, Amelia, Amelia who, who's our customer success manager, used to work with me at the Home Depot. Katrin, who runs data and analytics, we used to work together at Tiffany and company. She ran pricing for all of Tiffany. So people have, come, you know, I've met along the way and have, have come on this journey with me. Um, and I think that's really important because I know how they work. I know that we can work together, that we, we, you know, that we mesh. And it's really created a very nice culture for our, for our group. Are you guys fully remote or are you all in one destination? How do you guys approach the work life situation? So half of our team is here in New York with me and we meet up, yeah. you know, a couple times a week. And I think that's really important to be in person, especially as like a, a, a startup. We can just move a lot faster in person. So those that are remote, we try to get together. Like, you know, you know, Nikki very well. Yeah. She's our head merchant. And so we see each other probably once a month. So it's just really important to be together in person, to be able to strategize and brainstorm just that face to face. You can't really replace. And it was interesting when I was at the Home Depot, COVID had hit and we had mm -hmm. gone to 100% remote. And I was able, for some reason, to get on a one-on-one -on -one call with the CEO at the time, Craig. And he and I asked him, you know, what is your biggest, you know, challenge or fear right now? And his whole thing was around remote work and how can you maintain a culture with remote? And I do think that people struggle with that. You know, that culture, it's so important to bring people together. And so I really look for opportunities to be in person and make sure that we're continuing to maintain that culture. I think it's really hard to do via Zoom calls all day long. Yeah, Zoom calls, huddles, Slack mm -hmm. messages, all the yeah. all the things. Mm -hmm. 
Well, well, okay. So you were with Home Depot during COVID. And so mm -hmm. starting in Haven, obviously mm -hmm. crazy time to start a business, right? When half mm -hmm. the world or the whole world is shut down. Let's talk about that leap of faith moment. When did that actually, like when that light bulb turn on when you're like, all right, I've, as a consumer, I experienced this and I hear people say they want durability. They want this. You have this experience of standardization of like bringing these products to, you know, whether it's retail or commercial. So there's, there, there had to have been a moment where you were just like talking to somebody or thinking or having a cup of coffee or doing whatever. I would love to know that moment. So it was a podcast moment, actually. Will. Ooh. Uh, so I was listening to a podcast I listen to frequently called Pivot with Scott Galloway and Karis. Love, love Pivot. It's Such a good podcast. Yep. This is 2019. And they were talking about the Airbnb IPO. And a light went off in my head. Mm. They were talking about the $4 million, $4 million, $4 million hosts on Airbnb. And I started to think about my experience, how inconsistent it had been you know, to date. With staying at vacation rentals we had great experiences we had terrible experiences and i thought wow wouldn't it be interesting if we could get our home depot products on airbnb somehow and you know provide a discount and start to distribute those products and as the hosts and and property managers put those products in the homes guests will be able to experience those products look at the labels and then go you know you've got a new customer because these homes become show places mm. and so that was really the moment that i had and I started to think about the idea more and more. Um, at the same time, I was pregnant with my fourth child. And so, you know, it was sort of like, do I start this? Do I not? Um, yeah. and so I did take time off and really thought about it more and decided that, yes, there is a solution. I just kept talking to more and more people. And really, you, I just saw that there was a huge white space there um, and an opportunity to start this, this business. I love that. And okay, so we're obviously in very different positions. And I love bringing this up on the podcast. I've had met multiple guests who are dads or husbands or wives or mothers. And I'm very, very single and no kids, no nothing. And so I want to know how does that conversation happen? I'm sure it's not an overnight conversation when you're talking to your husband or where you're talking to family and when you're talking to people about like they've known that you've had a great job, a great career, and then to take that risk. With a, especially with a family, like right now, I only have one mouth to feed. And that one mouth is me. Like I don't, I don't have anybody else to think about. But you have four kids. You have your husband. You have this whole family that you guys have built. How does that conversation happen? And kind of maybe walk me through the phases, if there was any phase. So this wasn't the first idea I had. Okay, <laughs> perfect. <laughs> um, I had an idea maybe ten years or before that to do. We were living in these cramped four hundred square foot apartments in New York City, and I thought, "Gosh, we need to start a small furniture, you know, small space furniture line." Mm. And then immediately, which was then my boyfriend was like, "This is the dumbest idea I've ever heard of." Furniture <laughs> company, all the furniture companies I know just go bankrupt. Why would you ever do this? And so there, there were ideas like that. When I came to him and said, I really think there's an opportunity here in the vacation rental space, he does a lot of investments um, in hospitality, mm. particularly in the hotel space. And as we started to look at, at the way that vacation rentals are structured and sort of the opportunity, he really saw it. And he's probably the number, you know, outside of my team, for one fan of In Haven, he really does believe in our, our mission and he sees the, the value that we've created already for our existing customer base. So, you know, it took time. I, I built out a business plan. I was actually, I was thinking about Natalie Palmer. He's got, you know, a preemie baby or a baby in the NICU. I was actually, you know, in the NICU. I had my fourth child was born quite small. And so mm. in the NICU and literally thinking through, you know, hours of just this business plan as I'm also caring for this child. I think, you know, in general, I'm one of those people that I love being a parent. It's the most rewarding job I have. I also need like to continue to work. I don't think I could do, you know, one or the other. I like yeah. the balance of work and being a parent. So, you know, I think from that perspective, I was always going to continue to work. And I think it was great to have the support of my husband and my family to say, yep, we see the opportunity as well. Let's go for it. I love that. As a as a son and a brother of five sisters and many women in my life, I have to like always say women blow my minds on the things that you guys can do, like taking care of a baby who is early and premature mm -hmm. and then still having like, all these wild ideas to go start your own thing. Like I just, yeah. I'm not that way sometimes. Like I, yes, I have a thousand things happening at once, but I also have to be like very focused or else I get nothing done. So I, uh, I always 
give you massive credit for for all of that <laughs> stuff. Like you guys are just amazing. Um, Women are great at multitasking. Uh, yes, <laughs> us guys are uh, sometimes dumber than a brick wall, but that's okay. We <laughs> just kidding, but um, yeah. no, it's super super impressive. And I just I think about how hard it is to juggle real life on top of building a business that does come into a way of not just being a solopreneur, but having employees with real product and real like distribution. And there's there's so many realness levels that come into business and into to life. And so that the fact that you could do that, and it's super cool that you're talking about your husband and how he was able to do kind of like the research with you. I'm curious, what type of research did you guys do when looking into the vacation rental model versus a hotel? So, Cause like the mm -hmm. hotel side, like that's where I started. I love hotels and we'll never say like hotels are going to, you know, become extinct or anything, but I think it's it's such a different model from you know 2019 20 even like 2015 17 like all those years right uh, now with COVID we're seeing a lot of hotels become somewhat hybrid where they do implement short term rental tech like smart locks and door codes and other yeah. things but they've mastered standards right they've mastered it they've created consistency within brands and whether it's one hotel in one city with maybe three to pop up soon in another city or whatever, but you could also have like the Marriott cities as an example, right? They've mastered standards. So kind of walk me through your discovery through the business model of vacation rentals versus hotels and how that kind of fit with your business plan. Yeah, it's really been an evolution as I've gotten to learn more and more from my own customers, their challenges. So when we started out or when I started in Haven, you know, the goal was to bring hospitality grade products to the vacation rental industry. And very quickly, I learned that, you know, from our customers that are managing, let's say, 100 homes, right, they might have a portfolio of, of 80 sort of economy level homes and then 20 lux. And what their biggest challenge, I heard this over and over again, was I can't have a different product line in every single home. Like, it's just I can't scale that way. I may, may have been able to do it for the first 15 homes where, you know, you have sheets, these sheets in this home, this coffee maker and that, but it's just like it's not scalable. And so I need to standardize um, across my portfolio. And what I found was we can standardize certain, certain things across a portfolio, right? Hotels are very cookie cutter. You can walk into a Hyatt in Tokyo, Japan, or Cincinnati, Ohio, and you could be walking into the same place. You wouldn't know where you are. Yeah. Vacation rentals, why people you know choose vacation rentals, one of the reasons they choose them is for the uniqueness that that property offers, right? You want to feel like a local when you're in that when you're in that space. But what we found is we can standardize certain parts of the stay, and it's really around the comfort of the stay. So mm -hmm. the sleep, bathing, and eating experience. We can standardize, we can have, you know, you can set up a linen program to have the same linens across your entire portfolio. And look, that can be a revenue making stream for you as well. You can set up the same towels, the same shampoos, and the same kitchenware. This is where guests are not looking for unique experiences. They're not looking for a unique sleep experience, like a round bed or a water bed. They want just a good night's sleep. <laughs> yeah. And so that's where we feel that we can standardize in vacation rentals, those areas of the home, while honoring the uniqueness that comes with it. So, And then, what, then I started to get into, you know, I went down a rabbit hole of, okay, well, how did the hotels and restaurant industries do it? And they really are structured quite differently than the vacation rentals are, as you, you're aware. You have four main players with distinct responsibilities in the in the other hospitality industries, so restaurant and hotels. So, for example, in hotels, you have the distribution platforms. So you've got the Expedia's of the world, the Hotels.com. For for restaurants, that's Google or Grubhub. Mm -hmm. The second responsibility you have are those that set the national brand standards. So in hotels, that's the Marriott's and Hilton's of the world. And in, in the restaurant industry, that might be like McDonald's or Olive Garden. Then the third layer of people, players, is the local property managers. Those are the property managers that deliver that hospitality experience. They're the local boots on the ground. They make sure that the national standards are being upheld, but they're also the people that are delivering the experience at a local level. And those are local companies. And then you have the owners of these properties. So, mm -hmm. and those are typically individuals or private equity shops in the, in the restaurant and hotel space. Now in the vacation rental space, we've got the distribution, right? We've got the Airbnb, we've got the local property managers and we have the owners. What we're missing is that national standards. 
And so that's where we are working with our professional property managers to develop those national standards for the bed, bath, and kitchen, similarly along a chain scale. So, you know, in the hotel industry, you've got you've got economy level hotels like, you know, Holiday Inn Express, mm -hmm. all the way up to luxury with the Ritz Carlton's Amman Resorts. And you have very similar portfolios in the vacation rental space. And so we're helping to develop what are those standards for each of those area, or each of those mm -hmm. chain scales. So what can you expect in an economy level vacation rental from the bed, bath, and kitchen perspective all the way to the luxury level? And yeah. that's what we feel is clean. And that's why our vacation rental industry is known as Airbnbs. No one, there's no national brand, right? Yeah. There's no national standard. So that's what we've been left with is we're, we're Airbnbs. Well, I'm glad you said that because I was going to ask you because obviously like we've talked about this on multiple different shows, whether it's this podcast or our other show, Good Morning Hospitality and you, you know, like Megan Moylan with workflows and espressos, like all this stuff, right? This is a conversation I think is carried through multiple, multiple different channels and social media platforms. And I'm the reason why I'm glad you brought that up, because I wanted to ask in the sense of like there is franchise, right? Like a lot of the hotels, they've realized like, all right, the way to scale and to standardize scale is through franchising. And like franchising mm -hmm. has been such a great, you know, a movement for hotels, from, you know, the, if you listen to podcasts, you know, the uh, business wars where the Hilton and Marriott, right? Like they were the two that yep. figured that out together and, and kind of in competition, obviously. But anyways, what I'm trying to say is our vacation rental industry, the majority of operators are hosts. They are like, that is the biggest percentile of op like homes on Airbnb and Verbo, their owner operators or hosts versus the actual property management company amount. You know, that's way smaller but they are the ones that move at a bigger scale, right? You have one host that manages one property versus one property manager can manage hundreds, if not thousands. So with the property management side, obviously you and I know like people like Robin Cragen who have mastered Vail, Steamboat, Aspen, destination market, mm -hmm. high-end luxury. That's great to standardize because the guests really expect that no matter what. The chalet needs to be just top notch, right? Versus if you grab maybe my parents' place in Orlando, Florida, all the homes start to look the same, many hosts, owners. So like with the business model of like hotel franchises being standard, do you think short-term rentals will ever get a flag in order to then franchise or what's the road of standardization? How do you get 90% of the inventory that are individually host managed to become standardized in these three areas? All right, Slick Talkers, sorry to interrupt. Halfway through the episode, you're making it through. Thank you so much for tuning in. And you know, Hostfully has been a partner and sponsor of this podcast since the very, very early days of 2020. That's going on almost over four years. We're so thankful for their partnership. We use them for our vacation homes. Obviously, it's so important to have a hub. Everything that you need to know about your property from reservations and calendar management to then, of course, how do you manage your connections with your other suppliers like Minute or Wheelhouse or whatever you know, technology you use behind the scenes, Hostfully has the hub for you in order to make sure that you're managing your properties with ease and, of course, within one platform. Not only do they have great connectivity partnerships with other vendors in the industry, they have great distribution partnerships. So channels like Airbnb, Booking.com, Verbo, you name it, they're connected. Homes and Villas by Marriott. Pretty cool channel. You can't go wrong with their connection and distribution hub, but also, let's be honest, we're always on the go and having the Hostly mobile app to manage our vacation homes and any kind of emergency communications or extra pieces that we need to know is super crucial. So grab the link in the show notes, make sure that you connect with Hostfully today and they'll take great care of you. Will from Slick Talk had sent you, let them know you're gonna get a special offer as well in the link in the show notes. Now, like always, we're back to the episode. Thank you guys so much for tuning in and thank you to Hostly for sponsoring this episode and for the podcast in general. We love your partnership. Thank you guys so much. And now back to the episode. Okay, we're gonna go down a history lesson yes, here. Yes, I'm, yes, um, I, like, please, let's go. So there's a lot here that I wanna talk about, but I'll start with history. Hotels, the way that they're structured today have not always been structured this way. So if you go back to the 70s and 80s, there were two major things that happened in the lodging industry in the U.S. One is um, you had the mass production of cars. So suddenly people could afford cars like the Ford Taurus, the Toyota Camry. 
At the same time, the U.S. government was investing in the interstate highway system. So now you've got people that can afford cars and can travel. Mm-hmm. And along the U.S. highway system, all of these hotel, motels, independents started popping up. And what the guests really struggled with was the quality. They just mm-hmm. did not know what they were walking into. And so in the 1990s, a lot of things changed in the hotel industry. The major, one of the major changes was the launch of the Westin Heavenly Bed in 1999. Mm. The Westin put a stake in the ground and said, good sleep is no longer a luxury. It's a standard. Yep. And this is how we make it a standard across our, our hotel. And that, you know, all the hotel brands started to get on board, right? Before that, you had, you would show up in a hotel and you got lumpy beds with colorful color coverlets. Now everything went to white. Mm-hmm. And they were able to standardize. And what was very interesting to see in the data, and I'm happy to put this in your show notes, is mm. the hotel industry has grown over the last 35 years significantly. They've gone from, in the U.S., from 3 million rooms to 5.3 million rooms. All of the growth has come from the brands. The independents have seen zero growth. It's been stagnant. The independents are about 1 million, around 1 million hotel rooms. The rest of the growth is all from, all, the rest of the supply is all in, in the brands. Yeah. What this says is that the consumers want trust standards and they want to know what they're walking into. Now, the vacation rental industry is different, right? We don't want to create a cookie cutter model, as I said earlier. But I do think we can learn a lot from hotels and we can set standards around the bed, bath and kitchen. And that's not just at the moving mountains level who does it fantastically well at the luxury, but there are standards that you can set at the economy and mid-scale levels within vacation rentals. Because as a consumer, I don't always go to luxury hotels, right? Mm-hmm. They mm-hmm. Different hotels have different purposes. So for example, if I'm driving to my, to my daughter's soccer game in the middle of Pennsylvania and we need to stay somewhere for the night, I am so happy to see a La Quinta on the road and to stay, stop over there. Mm-hmm. I am not going to stay at Bob's Motels. Yeah, I no. feel like murdered there. I have no <laughs> idea what happened, but I'm like, I am searching. And if that La Quinta is sold out, I'm going to drop 30 miles more to find a branded economy stay. When I travel for work, you know, I'm happy to stay if I stay in hotels, a Weston, a Marriott, because I need, you know, the, the Wi-Fi, the, the, the F&B there, et cetera. And then if I'm going to on a honeymoon, I might spend up and go to like a Ritz Carlton. Right. And so all of those hotels, you know, you don't as a consumer, you can use all of the different chain scales. They have different you know, value for you for different purposes. And I really do believe that in the vacation rental space, we can start to set some standards around the bed, bath and kitchen at the different levels that we can start to communicate out. So guests know what they're going to expect when they walk in from a from a standards perspective. Then going back to just hosts versus property managers, we are very much focused right now at Inhaven on the professional property manager. Yeah. About 40 to 50% of demand right now in the, in the U.S. vacation rental space. And the reason that we're so focused on them, you know, I think Airbnb has created this massive ecosystem. From a product perspective, you've got home shared rooms spaceships, icon stays, you know, urban stays, suburban, and then these vacation destination stays and whole homes. It's it's just such a wide breath. And then you've got, from a host perspective, you've got part-time, first-time host, the national property manager brands like the Casa, and then you have these local hospitality teams. So we're very focused on the the professional property manager that's there um, providing that local hospitality. Their teams are the boots on the ground. Mm -hmm. And so that's where we're focused on sort of setting standards to start there. And then we think that eventually a majority of the industry will get on these standards. Well, without giving away the farm, this is my question. And I've been talking yeah. away, like I want, I've been asking people like Jamie Lane and other people in the industry. And cause you know, with the, the, you, you provide data and history. And I think obviously data and history go hand in hand. I think the vacation rental industry or the sector of hospitality is in its, you know, it's in its early stages of history moments, like the hotel, the Westin, right? So the Westin as a brand was able to set that bed standard and they're able to say, this is our new, this is how all hotels should be. Mm-hmm. They were able to set that and every brand followed. So my, I guess, question in the sense of standards and distribution is how do you get the hosts after you've, let's say, let's, and I'll, it's hard because you can never really perfect, you know, the, the professional manager side, right? Some of them are going to choose to adopt. And if they don't adopt, maybe they go out of business or maybe they find some kind of tweak or, you know, mm. customization to it. Um, but once you get that standardized in the professional sector, 
how do you distribute those standards to hosts, individuals who may not listen to this podcast or other podcasts or look at, you know, short-term rental content on Instagram? Like it's so fragmented on how to reach this type, you know, type of customer, right? Like this B2B. So where does the distribution route go? And I, I know this might like be like a question that's hard to answer in the sense of like giving away your roadmap or other things like that. So I, I get it, but that's the, that's the million dollar question. If you can master the distribution of these standards to individuals, whether it's, you know, does that mean a partnership with Airbnb and they create the standard and put it on to all their hosts? Like, what do you think that answer is? Yeah. Without giving away our roadmap, <laughs> um, <laughs> so I'll answer this question, but I think as more and more property managers, especially so we're starting with the professional property managers, set these standards, communicate those standards to their guests, and the guests start to book through those standards, you know, by searching for these specific quality level standards, mm -hmm. they're going to start to seek it, right? And they're going to start to seek these standards. So it becomes this really nice network effect of guests seeking the standards and getting the property managers and hosts on these standards. So you just kind of create this network effect and how that's going to happen, stay tuned, but... <laughs> You know, that's really what we're working on is how do we um, how do we communicate these standards effectively to to guests? Yeah. Do you think this yeah. is give me a time period? How long do you think it takes to have that ripple effect actually go into play? Right. Like it, that's what they're I forget the number. So I'll I'll fact check this later. But there's got to be like, what, seven million or eight million homes on Airbnb or, you know, that get used for short term rental use cases and somewhat, at least in the U.S., so are right, you up 8 million homes? How long does it take for that ripple to, to carry out? Do you think? I mean, we are at the beginning of an evolution. This is going to yeah. take years, hotel industry years. We are, if I go back to that analogy that I gave you in the hotels where they had the, you know, the uh, technology from the mass production of cars, plus the policy with the interstate highway system, but that led to a lot of, you know, guest uncertainty. Mm -hmm. um, we're in a similar situation with the vacation rental industry. From the technology perspective, it's really easy to list your properties and to find properties through the uh, OTAs. From a policy perspective, we have just gotten through COVID, and so you know there's a lot more work from home policies. So the vacation rental industry is now more than attract, you know, more attractive than ever. Mm -hmm. It's now how do you bring consistency and standards to that industry? And so this was a you know a 30 year evolution for the hotels. I think it can happen a lot faster now with technology in place, but I do think we're on like a multi-year evolution. Um, multi-year as in not just like two or three, like five, 10, maybe yeah, 15, sure. 20. Cool. Five or 10, I would say, you know, it's just going to take some time. Um, right now where we're focused is on that professional property manager. Um, and so we've got, um, you know, a, a bunch of homes right now on those standards and we're starting to communicate those standards as well. Yeah. We have a mixed audience. We have a lot of professional managers and entrepreneurs that listen. We also have recently discovered like a lot of individual hosts that want to grow and scale their own property management company. What advice would you give either party, right? Like, let's talk like professional managers first. What, give me some in Haven snippets and then let's also talk about the individual host who's maybe got two or three homes that they just started and they're really eager to keep going. But obviously we don't want them to be a hectic host, right? Or they're just running around putting out fires. We want them to actually thrive and grow through a really profitable, sustainable business. And we want them to be part of that revolution, right? Like we want these hosts, individuals to create companies and impact their local economies and all right. the other stuff. So I would love to know your advice for each. What I would say, and I think for both of them is hospitality is a local game, right? Mm -hmm. It's a local boots on the ground game. And I really fear all these companies that have come out and said, I'm te we're tech enabled hospitality because it just doesn't work. And we continue to see it not work. It didn't work with, you know, going back to um, resort quests. It's not working with the Casa, Sonder, all of its, you know, hospitality, you expect people to be there and to be serviced. And mm -hmm. so I think it's really important to have that local, those local boots on the ground to service the guests. I think about it for a couple of different ways. You know, the quality of the stay is directly and the quality of the service is directly related to the number of people, the number of staff members that you have. And I think you guys were talking a little bit about this on the podcast earlier this week or yesterday. Good morning, hospitality, but with Brandy. And so I think that, you know, if you look at just these no service, high tech solutions. So like in the restaurant industry, that would be a vending machine. In the hotel industry, that would be an RV park where you book your parking spot online mm -hmm. and you can pull up, right? 
you don't, as a guest, expect that level, that quality of service, right? You know you're, you're, you're going to get. And then you kind of go up to like McDonald's would be like another step up in the restaurant industry. You have one person in front of house. It's mainly t- kiosk driven. You go up from there and you've got like the cheesecake factory that might have, you might have three people. You've got a, you've got a front desk person or a, a maitre d' and then someone who's serving you in a busser. And then you go to Love and Madison Park, right? So you kind of like, as you kind of go up, you get more and more people. And I don't think as a vacation rental industry, you can charge a thousand dollars a night and do it only through tech, right? The guest expects service. And if something goes wrong and you have to enter that, that, that error or that, that, that issue in an app and then talk to someone who's a thousand miles away, that's a huge problem. Mm-hmm. And guests and owners are going to churn. And so I guess my piece of advice is that this business, you know, we are in the hospitality business and that takes people on the ground to provide a great guest experience for, for our guests. I love it. I love it. Yeah. That's really good. And yeah, it's a, it's a hard, cause uh, it's a hard question, right? You're in the moment now. We have to be reactive and somewhat proactive. I was talking to Robin Craig about that and a shout out to Robin multiple times on the podcast. One of my favorites, but in the sense of, uh, he, he's a great guy, great, great founder, great, great company all as well. But, you know, we're talking about a lot of, I think, early days hosts, right? They're very reactive, right? They get they get excited. They're on Airbnb. They're getting bookings. They're taking care of guests. They're dealing with owners. We're most likely the cleaner for the first couple turns until they're like, screw this. I want to hire a cleaner now and like figure this out. And so they're very reactive to some of the stuff in their business. And I always kind of ask the question of like proactiveness. And so I think what you're saying is, you know, instead of just like, trying to be very, very tech heavy. The proactive solution is by building that local operations, building that team that is in in destination, not just remote. And yes, you can have VAs and communications people, but yet at the end of the day, the problem solvers, the ones that provide the extra requested linens or the tour activities. You can still have these tech enabled solutions, but you can't charge a thousand dollars a night for that. Right. So there's, I think there's a huge disconnect in the industry right now and people thinking they can just implement a tech, tech enabled hospitality and still be able to charge the high ADRs. The guests aren't going to go for that. It just isn't how hospitality works. It hasn't worked in any other industry. So I don't understand how that would be possible in in vacation rentals and that you've seen it, you've seen the demise of a lot of these companies that have tried to do it that way, like Picasso and Flounder. It just doesn't work. And so we're in the hospitality business and I, you know, Huge shout outs to people that are doing it just exceptionally well, like the moving mountains of the world, Abode Luxury Rentals, Juniper, yeah. Beverly Sorrell from Best Nest. I could go on and on with just people that have these amazing local hospitality teams that are servicing these guests and providing a great experience in these vacation rentals. Well, lucky for our listeners, Rachel and the, yeah, Abode is going to be on the show. So we're we're excited for right. them to, to be on and talk about this stuff. So no, it's really interesting. And I just think it's, yeah, we're still so early. So a lot of like what I was trying to saying earlier is we're so in the moment now because we have to be in the moment. I think we're more in a reactive scenario right now because like you said, you can't be tech enabled and charge these high ADRs because mm-hmm. vacation rentals were the only lodging type, especially with drive to destination markets and other things like that because no one wanted to stay in a hotel. Hotels suffered mm-hmm. and we mm-hmm. got away with murder with these high ADRs and very low touch, high tech. Right. But yeah. it's changed now and we, we've seen that. So. That's really good advice. Uh, I told you in the beginning before we hit record that I would find a, a question out of the three that I kind of picked to ask you. And I, I also told you I want to be like founder focused with this podcast. I want to focus on Ashley. And obviously in Haven is a, a byproduct of, of you, right? Like I feel like every founder just can't start a company and not have a piece of themselves be with that company. But the question I want to ask you today, Ashley, and for all of our listeners, I've been doing this thing. If you know the Diary of a CEO, uh, with Stephen Bartlett, he has like these question cards that every time he has a guest on his podcast, they leave a question for the next guest without knowing who they are. And so those questions turn into a little card game. I've been asking these questions. It's been a lot of fun to get answers. So Ashley, your question today is going to be, tell me something about yourself that no one knows and would be surprised to know about you. So if you weren't, if you weren't watching the YouTube, my name is Ashley Chang, but I'm not Chinese. I'm blonde and my husband's Chinese. So uh, that was always shocking when I went to Asia, live in Asia and um, would introduce myself as Ashley Ching and they'd expect a Chinese woman to walk in and I'm, I'm Norwegian looking. <laughs> um, 
woman. But in all seriousness, one thing that people might not know about me is I'm super involved in my local community here in New York. I'm a deacon at my church and really involved in our local school and the treasure of our apparel community. So just, I, I really value community and involvement and giving back to my community. So I think that's one of the things that maybe I haven't talked about with my customers before. I love that. I love that. Something new and it's, it's crazy in a good way. Cause we haven't had a lot of people on the show, like talk about church or religion and the last three or four episodes, everyone has mentioned it. And so it's like very, it's actually, it's cool for me. I like, I like it. That's no, super cool. And not something I expected either. I, I was curious, like, do you have any hobbies outside of running in Haven? Like I, obviously you're active in your community. Do you have a hobby by any chance that you just love to do that is kind of out, out of the ordinary? I, well, I love to garden. Mm. Um, I find it to be like a huge stress reliever. I love yeah. doing it with my kids. We go to the flower shop, we pick out, everyone picks out these wild flowers and we garden together. I just like doing things with my hands. It's super rewarding for me just to watch things grow. We plant bulbs in the fall and see them bloom in the spring. It's so rewarding. So I think, yeah, we're, we're big, avid gardeners and then we just love the pool in the summer swimming. So I love that. Yeah. Awesome. Ashley, yeah. the, the famous question I ask everybody on the end of the every episode is all the listeners have just heard 45 to 50 minutes of conversation with you and me. And there's probably one, if not multiple things that they heard that just sparked a light bulb. They want to get to know you more. They want to ask you questions. They want to reach out. They want to connect. So what's the one place we're obviously going to put all the links in the show notes from your LinkedIn to your website, all the other stuff. But if you had one place to send people that wanted to kind of reach out and connect with you based on this conversation and hearing what you had to say today, where would you send them? Definitely check out our website, inhaven.com. You can reach out directly to me at ashley at inhaven.com, um, our LinkedIn. But I think one of the things that we're offering all of um, the listeners today is a promotion. So you can get $100 off your first order with the promotion code of SLICK in all capital letters. So we will uh, put those, that in the show note, but do check out In Haven. We're here to help you define those standards, help, help you maintain them. We didn't really get into that. We're starting to work on the promotion of those standards as well. Yeah, it sounds like we have to have you back for part two for <laughs> maintaining standards, not just setting yeah, standards. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> got a lot of cool tools under development. So this fall would be great. Awesome, I love it. Well, Slick Talkers, you heard it here first. Make sure you follow all things in Haven, Ashley Ching, give them all the love and support because just the way you support the show is by supporting our guests and it keeps things all flowing as well. So thank you so much, Ashley, for jumping on the podcast and taking the opportunity and for being so patient for me to actually get you on the show. I know we've been talking about this for a while, so I appreciate you being okay with that. And then also for the listeners, thank you so much for giving Ashley the love and support that you do like every other guest we've had in the past in the last six years almost. It's been so incredible and amazing to see the impact that listeners have. So you guys are amazing. And like always, we'll see you guys again next week. Thank you so much for listening. And thank you to our show partners for making Slick Talk, the hospitality podcast possible. We hope you enjoy the show and we would love to connect with you outside of the podcast. So you can follow us on all of our social media channels for daily hospitality content or find us on slicktalkthepodcast.com. And don't forget to rate, review, and subscribe so you never miss an episode. I'm your host, Will Slickers, and we will see you guys all again next week.